I've never been a hundred percent. Did it just die? <laughs> what is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Auto Auction Rebuilds. Boy, do we have a lot to cover today. So for today, I've got three videos that I need to record, and I'm trying to figure out which one I want to present to you today. Do we want to talk about the new C7 Corvette that already has a problem, a major problem, that's probably going to require to go back to the dealer and probably leave me without the Corvette for a while? Nothing like getting a brand new car and having severe problems with it within 40 miles and then possibly not being able to drive it, but you still got to pay for it. Should we talk about the 2004 Chrysler Crossfire Coupe? There's really nothing to talk about on the Coupe, all right? The Coupe is actually doing just fine. Or do we talk about the issues we're having and the solutions we found for the 2005 Chrysler Crossfire Roadster? Now, we could also talk about the Ford F-250. Unfortunately, the F-250 doesn't have anything wrong with it, okay? It's, it's the one car that's actually already good to go. So which one do you think we're going to talk about today? Oh, also, I've got a house update. Today, we're getting some of the finishing touches put on the house. So what are we going to talk about today? All right, so I made my decision. Today, we're going to talk about the C7 Corvette because there's nothing like spending a boat ton of money on a brand new car and then being left with a sour taste in your mouth. And no, not buyer's remorse. I'm sure many of you have had buyer's remorse and you know all about that. It's not a pleasant experience either. But uh, literally, I was sitting here in the driveway yesterday. I was setting up my XM presets and just out of the corner of my eye, I saw the gas gauge, which was full because the car has literally 40 miles on it. The gas gauge goes from full and it just goes <laughs> straight to empty. <laughs> and I, I kind of laughed, I was like, oh, that's cute. As some feature the car has or something. I don't know. I thought maybe it was about to turn off on me because I had it sitting here idling. Uh, no, 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 she wasn't going to turn off. I, I decided to take it for a drive. I was like, okay, that's weird. Maybe once I get on the road, put it in gear. I figured it was some weird feature the car had. So I took it for a ride, drove it about three and a half miles, came home, shut it off. Gas gauge was still on empty. I was like, well, that is weird. So maybe if I fire it back up, right? I turned the car back on check engine light. Let me show you why the check engine light's on. So as you can see, we've got two codes. One is for fuel pump B, insufficient flow or fuel pump insufficient flow, something like that. And the other one is the, uh, basically the sending unit is having issues. So I've been smelling this burning smell and I, I, I really thought at first, this horrible smell. It's a brand new car. You know, the exhaust, all kinds of stuff has coatings on it. And all of that stuff has to burn off as you drive it. So you can expect some weird and occasionally foul smells from time to time on a brand new car. But this, this, I mean, I noticed it when I was at the dealer and we first took it to the gas station for its first fill up with the, uh, uh, the guy, I believe his name was Zach, that rode with me. You could smell it then, but man, the other day I took it for that drive around, you know, is the three to four miles came back and it had me lightheaded and feeling nauseous. Now the smell, when you get out of the car really comes from the back here. It's not coming out of the exhaust. I don't know where it's coming from. It almost, it smells like something burning, but truly I thought that that smell was just coatings burning off of, I don't know, the exhaust or the rotors, the brakes, the clutch, who, who knows? Everything is brand new and still getting, you know, settled in. And I'm gonna show you around the car. I'm gonna show you some of the features, although I'm not gonna go into a Doug DeMero type thing. You know what I mean? Most of you have already seen the C7 and most of you already know just about everything about it. Um, let's go ahead and fire it up real quick and I will show you the check engine light that is still on and the gas gauge. Well, I need an exhaust sponsor for this car. I know, right? Check engine light, no gas gauge, and I need an exhaust. <laughs> That's how I roll, baby. So there's your gas gauge, right? Completely, it's just dead empty. And there's your check engine light right there. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, fuel range, none, <laughs> because it's, 
<laughs> and there's no uh, there's there's no there's no gas gauge. Now we're at 56 miles now because I did take it out and drive it around today. I was really hoping that this was going to just kind of uh, you know fix itself because cars fix themselves. That's normal. Wishful thinking. Yes, I'm aware. Um, believe me, I know that cars don't fix themselves. I'm not stupid, but it's just so damn disappointing to have this brand new car and, and, and have that problem within the first 40 miles. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. Now, I know a lot of you are going to say, Lemon Law. File, Lemon Law. Well, it's not quite that simple. The Lemon Law... Uh, basically, generically says that a car is declared a lemon in Oklahoma if the same repair has been performed, I think it's three or more times and still has not resolved the original issue, or if the car has been out of commission for more than 30 business days, which obviously 30 business days is going to be 38 actual days, um, at which point it's a lemon. Now, I don't want to jump on the Lemon Law bandwagon. I don't want to give this car back. I don't want them to buy it back. That's not my goal. I bought this car because it is absolutely beautiful and I love it. Okay, I don't actually love the car. I enjoy the car. I like the car. I don't actually love it. I don't, I'm, I'm not in love with the car, but goodness, she's beautiful. So. I don't want to jump on that bandwagon, and I've already had a lot of people screaming limit all that. that. That's not the goal here. I'm going to take it in. Hopefully, they can fix it, and we'll come back with a video talking about what's wrong with it, what actually happened. Now, I'm just going to go over some quick little features here. So, you know, these doors are electronic, right? This is, this is probably a big deal for a lot of people. I'm sure a lot of people wonder, all right, what if the battery dies? It will happen. At some point, the battery is going to die. These doors do not have, as you can see, there's no key. They're just this, it's just this electronic button right here that you push, see? So what do you do when it fails? Well, if you're inside the car, it's no big deal. It's also an electronic button right here. For, for being inside the car, you just pull this up, boom. Manually opens the latch, you're good to go. But what if you're literally locked out of your car? No problemo. Under the, under the hatch here, is a keyhole right there. There's a master key in each one of the fobs. You turn that, and I, I guess you wouldn't push this button because that's electric too. I think you just turn it and like push it in or something like that. That will open the hatch. Once you're in the hatch, you've got a door release right here. You only got one. You just pull it, and that'll open the door. Now, if, if for some reason, like the key fob, or the battery in the car is dead, I should say. If the battery in the car is too dead to open the doors, you may set off an alarm when you open the hatch without, uh, you know, by using this key back here. But it is what it is. I don't know what's back here. What is this, a, a power outlet? Why would you have a power outlet in the hatch? That doesn't even make sense to me. So, anyway, here's your beautiful 6.2 liter. This is, I may, I may have the specs a little off. I do know it's a 6.2 liter. It's an LT1. It's, uh, what is it, 600, or 600, <laughs> yeah, I wish, <laughs> 400 and like 50 horsepower and like 460 pound-feet of torque, something like that. I don't know, you guys can comment below and tell me for sure. It's riding on what I believe are Michelin Pilot Super Sports. My goodness, these are great and horrible tires. I <laughs> I, I honestly hate these tires, but at the same time, I really love them. I'll, I'll explain that. So this car has a build date of 8 of 19. So, I mean, this car literally was just bu just built a few months ago. Yeah, these are Michelin Pilot Super Sports. And these are some amazing tires. The rears are 28530 ZR20, uh, 95Y. So 95 is the load index, Y is the speed index. All right. And the fronts... What do we got on the fronts here? These are expensive tires too, man. The fronts are 245, 35, ZR19, 89Y. Now, if you notice, these are really sticky. You see the rocks stuck? To, 
<laughs> Look, there's another one right here. These, these are rocks literally stuck to the tires. Why? Because these are race tires. Now, I, I'm going to be honest with you. You Corvette fans are going to hate me for this, but those of you that don't really care for the Corvette, you're going to probably love me. Race tires to me are, are ridiculous for this car. This is not a race car, in my opinion. In my opinion, this is not a race car. Uh, a ZR1's a race car. A ZL1, I would also consider a race car. But a base model Stingray, to me, is not a race car. Most people that are buying these cars are never gonna race them. Well, never race them for real on the track anyway. You're never gonna race these. You're gonna race these on the highway, on the on-ramps, and you know, occasionally around, around town on your main strip or whatever in Terre Haute, Indiana, that would be Wabash or Ohio Avenue. <clears throat> Don't ask me how I know. Look, man, here's the deal that I have with the tires. These are ultra high performance summer tires. These are sticky, sticky tires. In the summertime, these are the tires you want in your car when it's gonna be nice and warm, hot outside, above 65 degrees. In fact, I'd say 70 degrees or above. These are the tires you want. These are gonna hook. These are gonna keep traction. These are gonna make this car ride like it is on freaking rails, man. But let me tell you, for the rest of us that just wanna occasionally speed around in our Corvette and just enjoy it. We're not trying to be race car drivers. These tires suck because they lose traction. I'd say once you get below 60, you start having issues. Now that it's winter time here and we're falling into the 60s during the day and easily into the 30s at night, these tires are almost unusable. In fact, I would call them dangerous. They're not any good for wet driving. You're gonna break loose and lose traction all the time in wet, wet weather conditions and in cool to cold weather conditions. So in my opinion, these tires are worthless. Okay, great for summer, but for the rest of the year, these tires are worthless. So the first thing I had to do is go online and look up how much a set of tires is gonna cost. Let me tell you something, the, the best tires I found that are good for the oh also these are run flats run flat tires also suck because they're made of a harder material so that when you run out of air the tire will still ride on the rubber for like 100 miles so they ride rougher this car has the ackerman or crow hop dog walk uh there's so many names people call it wheel hop that's also to do with the tires it's also to do with the geometry of the front end but when you make sharp turns the front end literally cracks and pops and you think the front end is falling apart. it scared the bejesus out of me i thought the front end was destroyed on the car that i ran over something no it's perfectly normal so what i found was the michelin uh pilot sport all season threes they're about a thousand fifty dollars not installed a thousand fifty dollars for the tires those tires are actually going to work a lot better for me because they are all season they're high performance all season tires you're going to lose some of the stickiness some of the grip in the summertime i'm okay with that i need something i didn't buy this vet so they can be a garage queen okay i didn't buy this car so i can hide it in the garage occasionally open my garage door and show my neighborhood look at me i've got a corvette that hides in the garage i bought the car because i want to drive it because i love chevrolet i love the brand and i love the c7 corvette and it's not going to be a garage queen. Besides, the garage queen around here is that tow dolly. <laughs> That's the garage queen over here. So anyway, it's $1,050 for the tires. I got to pay for install. So that leaves me wondering, you know, what do I do? Do I buy a second set of rims, pull these off, keep these rims and tires, use them for the summertime when they're actually going to be, you know, working at peak performance, use the other all seasons for the rest of the year, or do I pull the tires off, sell the tires? I mean, they've got, what, 50 miles on them? Surely I could still get 800 bucks out of the set, maybe, to some, some Corvette guy is going to want them, some C7 owner is going to want them, maybe. Um, I don't know. Comment below and tell me what you think. You know, a set of rims and tires is going to run me about $2,500 for a new set of rims with new tires already installed, about 2500 bucks. Then we could just put these on and off as we want. But that's a lot of money, guys. I got a lot of other stuff going on. The last thing I expect is to buy a brand new Corvette and need $1,000 worth of tires because these tires were only intended to be used on dry, on dry surfaces in the summertime when I bought the car in the winter. So that is my big gripe about the tires. Next, I got to tell you, so many people are always commenting if a car is not here. 
I understand inquiring minds must know, but guys, gals, please, please, I still have all my cars, all right? We have the C7 now. The C6 has been replaced by this. We still have the hardtop coupe crossfire. We have the convertible crossfire roadster. We have the F250 truck. We still have the Camaro 2SS that is missing. We still have the Chevy Cruze. Okay, we still have all of those cars. So where is the Camaro? I, I seem to be getting that a lot on Instagram and Facebook. Where is the Camaro? Jessica has possession of the Camaro. I gave the Camaro to her and the Corvette is mine. So she works 12 hour shifts. She works really long days. She works really hard. She's dedicated to her job and I respect what she does for a living. It's not a job that most people could do. She drives the Camaro. That's where the Camaro is at. We didn't get rid of it. It's still here. All the cars are still here. Not to worry. We still have the Camaro. So what are we going to do with this? I guess we're going to take it down to the dealer at some point. Well, we'll do an update video and see what the dealer says about it. I've thought about just plugging in my scanner and clearing the codes and seeing if the fuel gauge magically comes back by clearing the codes. I, I don't think it will. Now, I bought this car. It's base. I mean, it is base, base model. There's no heated seats. There's no heads-up display. There's, there's no remote start. There's nothing special. You've got your infotainment system here. Ah, oh, lovely. I don't want the radio, dagnabbit. So you've got audio settings, your phone, projection for uh, Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, OnStar navigation. You've got your OnStar buttons up here. Uh, text messages come through. What else? There's an app store, I think. And then you've got your little Chevrolet apps and Fox apps and all this other, all this other good stuff. You got your main screen here. What I really do love about this car is the rev match feature. I'll put it in first gear. You see that button down there is, is white where it says one. Now watch, it'll turn yellow. That's rev match. So now when I go to drive, uh, when I go to shift through the gears, it will automatically rev match the engine. Now I know an experienced driver can do this themselves, but as I said before, I've never tried to imply that I'm an expert driver or that I'm a race car driver or a real pro. I'm not, I'm an amateur. I just love driving cars. And the Corvette is uh, its a somewhat difficult car for me to drive as a stick shift because it's got so many dang gears, man. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is kind of insane. It's seven speeds. Don't get me wrong, it's a lot of fun, but uh, you got to be careful shifting into these gears until you really learn where each one is at. So the rev match feature really helps me to not have to worry about matching the revs worry about the car jerking as you shift gears uh, <laughs> thank god for the rev match feature call me lazy i guess i am but i love the rev match feature now you've got all kinds of settings that you can go into man um you can change you can change the display performance i don't remember i don't remember if this is it or not yeah, so you got your G-Force, acceleration 0 to 60, all, all the good stuff, you know, all the normal stuff that you'd get with pretty much any car these days. Options menu, US or metric, uh, blah, blah, blah. Your oil pressure, oil temperatures, speed warning. No, we don't need speed warning. You know, I'm not going to go through all this because it really doesn't matter. I, I love this feature, though. So if I was a drug dealer which obviously I'm not. Um, you won't catch me right and dirty, but you will catch me being white and nerdy. Uh, you got a little USB port back here. I guess that's for a flash drive, so you can plug all your music into it. Nice little cubby hole so you can store whatever you want to store there. It's also got a really cool feature called, uh, oh, it's under settings, and it's valet mode. Valet mode is really cool because if you enter I'm gonna enter it real quick. Valet mode makes it to where basically nobody's gonna screw with your car, man. The radio is turned off. You can't do anything. This screen will no longer go down. You can't open the glove box. It's electronically locked. So the glove box does not open anymore. Um, yeah, it basically puts the car in uh, baby mode. I I'll say baby mode uh, because I don't, wanna, I don't wanna cuss or say anything. <laughs> it puts the car into a, an, undesirable mode that I don't think most people are going to want to use it in. So I really, 
I really enjoy the uh, the feature. There we go. See that now? Now we're good. Bingo. All right, everything is back to life now. Now you can open your glove box. See? I like it, man. I like it. It does have dual zone climate control. It runs and drives really well, but I'll be honest with you, it's just too quiet. Listen to this. Listen to this exhaust, man. That is pathetic. That is really pathetic. Come on, Chevrolet. <laughs> it's a Corvette, man. You got to do better than that. So I'm hoping we can get a sponsorship with somebody to... to... That's got to go, man. That stuff is absolutely horrible so what are the future plans for the corvette aside from trying to decide between rims and tires i want to get the windows tinted obviously i like getting the bar across the top i want these windows tinted these are not tinted it's weird because the back windows are they tinted these but they did not tint these i don't really understand that but we got to get the windows tinted for sure and i want a spoiler on this i think it looks so good with like the z06 spoiler and no i'm not trying to make a base model look like a z06 it's just personal preference. I'm not trying to fool anybody into thinking it's a Z06, but I really love the Z06 spoiler, and I definitely gotta get one. Now, we can't do any like hardcore driving or racing or hard braking or harsh corners or anything like that. This car has a 1,500 mile break-in period. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> it really sucks. Basically, we just have to drive her responsibly, drive her gently, definitely for the first 500 miles you've got to be very careful with it and then you know for the first 1500 miles you can't really just be torturing it you can have some fun with it but no track days none of that i probably won't take it at the track anyway and i know there's going to be a few of you wondering this is not a dry sump system this does not have the z51 package so it's not a dry sump it's a wet sump yeah you know i'm, I'm fine with it i wasn't looking to buy a race car i just wanted the new Corvette. I wanted the warranty. I wanted a brand new one. And I wanted the Ticket Me Red or Retail Red, whatever you want to call it. This is exactly what I wanted. And I know the automatic is faster than the stick shift. I'm well aware. But do you realize the C8 will not have a manual transmission? They're gone. This is the last of the Corvettes that are still traditional Corvettes. This is a front engine, well-balanced, rear-wheel drive, amazing piece of American engineering. Aside from the fact that quality control seems to be a little bit laxed, <laughs> aside from that, this is a phenomenal car. This is like the best bang for the buck. Horsepower per dollar. You can't beat a Corvette. I don't care what year, take your pick. Well, okay, I do care what year. Anything C4 and up is the best bang for the buck, the best dollar for the horsepower, in my personal opinion. I don't think you can do better than a vet for the money. So for people like me that aren't rich, but you want to have some style, and you want something with some oomph, some speed, some get up and go, this is the perfect car for someone like me. And this is the last of its breed. This is it. Yeah, some people don't like the C7. Some people are true Corvette fans and fanatics, and that's fine. I respect you, and I understand where you're coming from. I've never been 100%. Did it just die? <laughs> anyway, I've never been 100% sold on every angle of the car, but overall, I really do like the body style, but I definitely also love the older body style Corvettes as well. This is the last of a dying breed, and it's not dying, it's dead. 2019 is the end of the Corvette as you know it and as I know it, and it is definitely the last time you can get a Corvette with a manual transmission. So, nostalgia, maybe. Maybe a little bit, I didn't want my fiance to be able to drive it, and I know she can't. So all of that played into my decision to buy this. Now, why didn't I buy a C8? Well, because of the strikes, the UAW, uh, the C8 is probably going to be delayed some. I didn't want to wait for it. They're having great end-of-the-year closeout deals on these. They're prepping for the C8s to come in. These things are dropping in price. Dealers are almost giving them away. I had like $10,000 off the MSRP for being a Corvette owner already, 
uh, end of the year clearance event. They just had so many specials going on. This thing was just too good of a deal to pass up. So instead of waiting for a C8, I decided to take my chances on a C7. So do I regret my decision? Nah, not at all, man. I am, to say I'm disappointed would be an understatement. I'm very upset that the Corvette has issues. I love my GMs. Any of you that follow this channel know that I love my GMs, but I'm going to be quite honest with you. The quality of General Motors lately is, uh, I mean, I would, I would say it's subpar. Uh, that's been my personal experience. I got to say my personal experience because I don't want to generalize it and end up with a lawsuit for, you know, defamation or something like that. Uh, it's my experience. My, uh, my 2016 Camaro SS has 30,000 miles on it. It has been to the dealer so many times for transmission issues on that. Uh, I forget what the transmission is called, but it's the eight speed automatic transmission. And that scared me away from a Corvette with an automatic. Although from what I understand, these new Corvettes have a 10 speed automatic and they are phenomenal. I have no experience with that. My latest experience is a 16 Camaro SS that has an eight speed automatic and that transmission has been horrible. It is clunky, it is jerky, it's loud. And we were having all kinds of issues with it not shifting properly, slipping. It's been a nightmare. You can Google it, look it up. You'll see the, the eight-speed automatics, and not just in the Camaros, but any GM that uses them have been, they've been trouble. They've been real trouble. So that sucks as my first experience with the new Camaro SS to have those kinds of problems. And then to have, you know, a fuel pump issue, I'm assuming, fuel sending unit issue with this, plus that burning smell that I think might be related. Also very concerning. So I'm not happy with that, but I wanna point out that's not the fault of the dealership. The car had three miles on it when I bought it. This car could have landed at any dealership anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world for that matter. It just happens that it landed at the dealership I purchased it from because my last name is Shear. For those of you that don't know, the last name Shear means you will have bad luck your entire life somehow or another our name is cursed and although it may look like things are doing great around here trust me when i tell you things are constantly going wrong i'm constantly fighting to keep things going you have no idea what it's like to have the, the last name sheer if your last name is sheer comment below because i bet you have the same experience so with that being said ladies and gentlemen i appreciate you taking the time to watch my little rant video and quick little walk around and my experience with the chevrolet corvette keep in mind we're going to take it to the dealer i'll update you as things continue and progress on what the cause was maybe they fixed it and uh, i hope you guys enjoyed the video if you did give the video a big thumbs up don't forget to share this content with your friends i truly appreciate it share it across your social media platforms and uh, follow me on Facebook and Instagram, Auto Auction Rebuilds. And until next time, stay safe out there, everybody. We will catch you all very soon in the next one.